Hello, and welcome to another Open Frameworks audio programming tutorial. Today we will be getting audio from the real world and using it in our Open Frameworks project. Using the project generator, generate a new project, and from the tutorials before, throw in a copy of our audio tools file and include that in your header. Or you can simply grab a link from the description if you haven't been following along. So let's add our audio out function as we usually do. and our exit function. All right, so we will need a new function for this tutorial, and that'll be called audio in. This can have the same constructor as our audio out function. So point to a float, input, buffer size, and number of channels. All right. Let's make a sample rate, and this time let's add a buffer size. Let's add our three new functions to our CPP file of app.cpp. and our exit function. All right, we can make our setup function as we normally do of sound stream setup. Two output channels, we'll use one input channel this time. Sample rate, buffer size, and number of buffers. All right, so the only change we've made is uh, one input instead of zero as we've been doing before. All right, so since we have an input, this function will be called. Right now we're doing nothing with that function. So let's do one quick thing. Let's close our sound stream when we close the program. And let's run the application to make sure everything works. Nothing should happen. <coughs> Great. Okay, so obviously the new element where we're focusing today is here. The audio in function works in re the reverse of our audio out function. Samples come in and we can use those samples once they're all in. So samples are recorded at discrete time intervals very precisely and once the input buffer is full we can access those samples and this function is called automatically. So we're going to need to store our input buffer somewhere we, we can use it later. So let's make a new array we we'll use a vector so it's easily resized. Vector of floats. And we'll call this input buffer. Okay, before we use it, we need to make sure it's the right size. So input buffer dot resize. All right, so as is true with the audio out, the um, this buffer will need to be the size of the buffer size times the number of channels. In this case we have one input channel but I will go ahead and add that so it's clear what to change if you end up using more than one input channel. So, but I did not need to do this for a monophonic input obviously. Okay so to collect our samples We simply need to assign input buffer at i to input at i. 
So this function will only be called once this array is full of brand new audio samples, and it will be called automatically. Once that happens, we'll fill this array as fast as possible. All right, but as I said, I hinted at before, these are coming in interleaved. So we could write times number of channels plus zero, like we do in our output function. Obviously, this isn't necessary because number of channels equals one and plus zero is adding nothing. So this is the same thing as not having it. But if you do more than one channel of input, you simply do that. And if you have 20 channels of input, you can do this 20 times, or you can write an additional for loop to collect all of your audio samples if you're doing a massive amount of inputs. But we we're only doing one, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. And let's do the simplest test we can. Let's take our input and push that to the output. We'll be doing two channels of output. And we'll pan this to the center. Okay, so our input sample is equal to our input buffer at index i. So this function won't be called until this is this function is called. Whoa. All right, so that guarantees that input buffer at i is the next sample <clears throat> of the input. So this actually works out very simply. Even if you uh, don't quite understand what's going on, this will work. All right, so if we assign current sample to our input sample, we should be good to go. We could have just assigned our current sample to input buffer, but I like this naming so we can be clear on what is what and we can do processing on the input sample later. All right, so let's run the application and see what the problem we'll have is. Test, test. test. All, right, All right, so you, so can, you can hear, hear the, the delay. delay. So this is taking 512 samples to collect before, we're waiting 512 samples before this function is called. It takes 512 samples to fill this input. Once it's filled, it takes 512 samples to process and push that buffer out. So we have a total of 1,024 audio samples before, in between our input and our output. So let's go ahead and get an idea of how long that is. So that'll be buffer size divided by sample rate. This will give us how many seconds of delay we have times 1000, cast that as a float just briefly. Now we'll have how many milliseconds between input and output. All right, so this is just how long it takes for audio to be recorded and available to the system we need to know how long it takes for audio to be recorded and pushed back out. So this would be buffer size times two. Okay, so this will print to the console and it should be something around 20 milliseconds. If we, we have, have 21.3 21 repeating milliseconds of delay. So there's a couple ways to make that less. It, it, you could be tempted to just make the buffer size one. Let's see what happens when we do that. A lot of errors. You're not even getting much audio. Note the error we're getting here. Over underflow detected. That can come from a number of ways. The you'll usually get that if you're doing too much processing in your audio out and your CPU can't keep up with the demand. One annoying thing about audio programming 
is that it's only going to use, it's a single thread, so it's only going to use one of the cores of your CPU to process. And there's very rare cases where you can use multiple threads. Um, that's just the reality of the situation, unfortunately. And another reality is you can't use an input buffer of one. It takes the, between the CPU and the audio card, it takes time to move the sample to, the, uh, to RAM and from RAM back to the audio card. So we need to give this enough time. That's why we have a buffer in the first place. So if I always use 512, depending on the situation. That's actually fairly large. You can usually get away with 64. But if you're doing some intense calculations here, you definitely want to give it more time to calculate the samples. So my usual, a good, a good middle ground is 128 or 256. Use your discretion and just know the reality of the situation. Um, maybe it may be one day that that's no longer a problem. We can move um, the samples more quickly, but it's been this way for a long time. And it's probably going to stick around for at least another ten years. Maybe this is something we can tell our grandkids that we had to do. Okay, so let's just change it to 64. I think we can get away with that. Let's see if we're still getting any uh, underflow. We're not. So, so we, we got, got a few, few at the beginning. beginning. I'm going to turn my mic off. <laughs> my One of my mics off. Okay, so we got a few at the beginning. And I get this sometimes, and they never appear again. So that's fine. And we're only getting 2.6 milliseconds of total latency.